Okay. Hello, I'm Rosalie Paul. I'm a proud member of Peace Action Maine and Women's International League and Veterans for Peace. And yes, the Maine National Guard. These are all the groups that are sponsoring today. Also Greater Brunswick Peace Works. Um, an awful lot of good work has been done in the past 40 years by those groups. 40 years for Peace Action. Soon it'll be 20 years for Greater Brunswick Peace Works. Um, so we are all very pleased to be sponsoring Bruce's talk today. So um, it's my job to introduce Bruce Gagnon to those who, who don't already know him. Um, he is most notably the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, which is a title that really does boggle the mind. Why should there need to be such a network? What has our technology become other than a terrible illness, I do believe. So we're very, very grateful to Bruce. He's one of the few uh, clear voices on the subject of militarism altogether and, and of this awful space force that I think we all care a whole lot about stopping if we can. Um, he asked me to be brief and I will be brief knowing that if you go to his website, which is space for peace, dot org, and the four is a numeral, not a word, spaceforpeace.org, you will find his very inspiring and interesting and even sometimes surprising um, work history and resume. So please do that. Um, I uh, think I've mentioned all the groups that are sponsoring. And um, I just want to say that we're so lucky that Bruce is one of those remarkable people who can research and, and, and explore and absorb details that none of us wants to hear anyway, and then turn it all into something that feels to us like good old fashioned storytelling. So that makes it really easy for us to do our job, which is to spread the word as far as we possibly can and work to build movement around this. Thank you so much, Bruce, over to you. Thank you, Rosie. Let me just thank everybody for coming on the on the call and thanks also to Martha for organizing it. I was asked to say a few words about myself and how I got started in all this. I grew up in a military family uh, in 1968, uh, living in the panhandle of Florida. I was a young Republican for Nixon uh, growing up on military bases. I was indoctrinated in military uh, way of life and thinking. Uh, but it was in 1971 during the Vietnam War when I joined the Air Force and my first permanent base was Travis Air Force Base, California, an airlift base for the war. And as it turned out, uh, when I checked into the barracks, they only had one room left and they put me in with one of the leading organizers in the GI resistance movement. So at night there would be meetings, some nights white guys, some nights Black Panthers from the cities talking about racism, uh, everybody talking about the war in Vietnam. And very quickly, my life changed very dramatically. And it was there that I became a peace activist. Uh, after leaving college prior to graduation, because I was uh, offered a job working for the United Farm Workers Union as an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida, uh, by 1982, I had moved uh, seeing that the uh, Reagan military buildup uh, was cutting social programs. And so I started to move in the peace movement. And on June 12th, 1982, some of you might remember that date. It was a special session on disarmament in New York at the United Nations. And there was an, almost a million people protesting against nuclear weapons that day. I didn't go, but I watched it on C-SPAN. They covered fully the speakers and the rally and everything else. And afterwards, they cut away to a right-wing conference. And the speaker at that was Lieutenant General Daniel Graham, who was Ronald Reagan's head of SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, or what we popularly call Star Wars. And during the Q&A, someone said, General Graham, aren't you worried about that demonstration in New York today? There's almost a million people there. He said, no, actually, I think it's fantastic because they're out there protesting against nuclear weapons and we're moving into space, they don't have a clue. So let them keep doing what they're doing. And it was in that moment 
June 12th, 1982, that I began paying attention. I was living in Orlando. The Space Center was less than an hour away. And over time, I began taking people there repeatedly to protest against various military launches. So that's how I got into that. What I want to talk about today is first the historical and the current global context in which Space Force was created. And most importantly of all, I want to talk about the overall US military strategy that Space Force was created to help implement a strategy that's been going on for some time, but is now becoming ever the more uh, dangerous and provocative as we go along. So with that in mind, um, let's see if I can go to the first slide. Oh, okay. Uh, the US space program was really created <clears throat> by the, by the uh, Nazis Nazi scientists that came to the United States. Uh, anyway, uh, Operation Paperclip after World War II was, was a secret military program to bring over 1,500 of the top Nazi operatives to the United States. People that helped create the CIA, people that went into flight medicine, all different aspects of the US military industrial complex were seeded by these operatives, uh, these Nazis. But one uh, group of them uh, were the rocket team, might as well just stay where we are here now. Uh, the rocket team uh, led by Werner von Braun in the suit there, surrounded by a bunch of Nazi officers. He was uh, in charge of the operation at Dora, a secret military production operation inside a mountain tunnel in Germany where they had thousands of Jews and gypsies and French resistance fighters and all kinds of different people uh, that they were using as slaves to build the B-1 and B-2 rockets that the US was using to terrorize various European cities. I mean, that uh, the Nazis were using to terrorize various European cities toward the end of World War II. And in this place of Dora, thousands of these slaves died at the hands of the Nazis. One time they tried to uh, sabotage the operation by leaving screws unturned or urinating on the wires. And a hundred of them were launched, uh, were lynched rather by uh, the Nazis to show others that you will not dare do this kind of thing to our war effort. Okay, this is a picture of von Braun with Major General Walter Dornberger who was Hitler's liaison to the rocket team, to the Nazi rocket team. He was in charge of making sure for Hitler that uh, von Braun had everything they needed. They kept asking for more slaves, more money to build these rockets. And he came over during Operation Paperclip to the United States, became vice president of Bell Aerospace. And in the 1950s, Dornberger, Major General Walter Dornberger testified before the US Congress telling the uh, Congress that, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And he laid out a vision of orbiting battle stations in space that would allow the United States to control the planet below and to control the pathway on and off the planet. I call it the Nazi prophecy. This is the V2 rocket that von Braun and the slaves were making inside the mountain tunnel at Dora and a hundred copies of this rocket were brought to the US along uh, with Von Braun and his rocket team, ultimately to Huntsville, Alabama, to the Redstone Army Arsenal that is today known as the Pentagon of the South. A Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville is now in competition with Colorado Springs to be the new Space Force headquarters. Okay, next one. This is a picture of inside the mountain tunnel at Dora where the slaves were building the rockets. Okay. This is the group of uh, Nazi scientists and engineers that were brought first to White Sands, New Mexico to Fort Bliss and then ultimately to Huntsville where they uh, began their serious work. Okay, go to the next one. 
here's a picture of von Braun with several of these Nazi scientists and also the uh, US military officer, just to show you the connection between these Nazis and the US military as they set to the task of creating the US space program. All right. In 1989, the Congress commissioned a study uh, written by a congressional staffer called Military Space Forces the Next 50 Years. And in this book, very important book, I, I believe, uh, they lay out two things that I think uh, are pretty crucial. One is that nuclear reactors, nuclear power will be absolutely necessary in the future to power space-based weapons. And secondly, that the US must control the earth moon gravity well. Think of a wishing well. Imagine someone is down inside the bottom of a well and you're at the top. Because of gravity, you have the advantage. Well, it's the same thing between the earth and the moon. There's a well, a gravity well between the earth and the moon. And whoever sits at the top of that gravity well controls who can get on and off the planet earth. And so in this book, there's a quote that I've long ago memorized. It says, with our armed forces lying in wait at that location, meaning at the top of the well in orbiting battle stations, we would be able to hijack any rival shipments upon return. So they're looking ahead to the next 50 years when it's possible to mine the sky for precious resources and that the US military wants to be able to control the pathway on and off the planet Earth to determine who gets to mine the sky and who doesn't, okay? This is another uh, military planning document from the US Space Command. Uh, in 1997, it was published. And in this document, they talk about controlling and dominating space and denying other countries access to space. This document really, we got a hold of this uh, by our friends in Colorado Springs that went to a big uh, arms bazaar there in their city. And uh, they got that and we were able to distribute this all over the world. All right. Also in Colorado Springs has long been the Air Force Space Command headquarters. And this is the building and, the, and most importantly, their logo, Master of Space. They wear this uh, on their uniform as a patch. And so clearly the United States has long been saying that we're going to control space, dominate space, deny other countries access to space, that we're going to be the master of space. I like to call it master of disaster. Okay. So what we know today is that all warfare on the earth below is coordinated and directed by space technology. Just as an example, in 2003, in George W. Bush's shock and awe attack of Iraq, in the initial days of the attack, 70% of the weapons that were used from any kind of format uh, were directed to their targets using space technology. So with military satellites, you're able to see everything, you're able to hear everything, and you're able to target virtually every place on the earth below, okay? So no matter whether you're a troop on the ground, in a tank, in a Humvee, you're in a ship, you're in an airplane or space technology itself, everything is now directed by military satellites, all right? And so the Space Command has bases in the United States at various locations, many of which today are being renamed Space Force bases. For example, Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California have recently been renamed Space Force bases and a whole host of other ones are going to be named that as well, all right? And additionally, they have key locations around the world. What we've learned is as satellites orbit the earth, they have to relay their signal directly to the earth below, which then gets relayed to other satellites and ultimately back to the United States. So the US has had to establish bases around the planet that talk to the satellites and help direct this warfare operation. And all of this is done in split second time, what they call real time. And incidentally, the membership of the global network largely comes from many of these places around the world where these downlink 
facilities are located because people in those communities say, hey, we don't want our country to be used by the United States as a base for this Star Wars program. Okay. One key location is Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado near Denver. It's one of the major centers that receives all the signals from all these other locations around the world when they get eventually sent to the United States. So Buckley is a key receiving station for all these communications that get relayed by satellites, okay? Filingdales in North Yorkshire up in, in the northern part of England is a key radar facility that is used to uh, keep an eye on Russia, everything they're doing to help target warfare aimed at Russia, and also is increasingly involved in planning for missile defense and direction of missile defense. Okay. All right. Cape Cod, Massachusetts, another one of these space radars, uh, also plays an instrumental role in helping to direct these, this whole warfare system, all right? Crowton Air Force Base England is, in the last few years has been undergoing massive uh, development. It's a major US communications relay base for Europe, Africa, and Middle East. So their job is to relay communications of the military to the military uh, throughout the, those regions back to the United States and beyond, all right? S-Range, another place up in Northern Sweden that's undergoing major expansion at this time. Its uh, role is largely to intercept communications from Russia and to relay them to US NATO countries, all right? Kwajalein Atoll, you've all heard about this in the Pacific Ocean. They have a launch facility there where they uh, practice uh, Minuteman missile uh, launches that are launched from uh, uh, Vandenberg in California towards the, towards the uh, Pacific. And then Kwajalein has a launch uh, where they launch and try to intercept them. This is all part of missile defense practice. They also uh, do other kinds of missile targeting in the region. So a key installation for the US, all right? Uh, this is a place that um, a couple of us from the Global Network went to a few years ago. It's a U.S. Navy installation built inside of a, uh, a pristine uh, uh, olive grove, uh, endangered olive uh, grove. Uh, many trees were cut down to build this, and there's been a huge resistance movement in Sicily to oppose this. This uh, place is a Navy communication and drone operations center for mostly African military operations, all right? Another key installation for the US, again, up in Yorkshire, Northern England, is Menwith Hill, which is an NSA spy base. They intercept all phone, fax, and email communications from, out, uh, from throughout Europe, and also increasingly are being involved in military uh, war fighting targeting operations, all right? This is New Zealand, a US spy base in New Zealand, Waihopi, uh, that uh, that deflated uh, uh, thing there you see, peace activists got in there with sickles and deflated that some years ago, spent some time in jail, but it's a key installation in the uh, Asia Pacific region, okay? This is one of the most important US uh, spy bases in the world. Uh, just as Menwith Hill in Northern Yorkshire intercept all phone, fax, email communications throughout Europe, Pine Gap intercepts all phone, fax, and email communications throughout the Asia Pacific region. And uh, they are heavily involved in drone operations in the Middle East as well. Netflix has started a, or created a, uh, program uh, series on Pine Gap. It's quite boring. We watched two or three episodes and gave up on it. All right. So the US has initially started out with what they called five eyes. On the left side, you see US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. These were the key 
spy installations around the world, but it got expanded to nine eyes. And today now in the right column, 14 eyes. So you can see that the US is working overtime to bring more and more allies into this program to spy and direct warfare through military uh, satellite technology around the world, okay? So the Air Force Space Command and the US Space Command that grew out of that were long the uh, kind of the, the heads of this program. But now with the introduction of Space Force, it's a little confusing as to how uh, they're gonna work together, who's gonna be in charge of what. Uh, I don't even think the military has figured it out yet. So uh, it's something that we're trying to pay a lot of attention to as we go forward, okay? Now I wanna to talk to you about some of the various technologies that are being developed for offense in space and through space. Not all of these technologies <clears throat> in the end will work out. Uh, some of them will, some of them already have, but I just wanna give you an idea of some of the things that are underway. This is the military space plane or the X-37. They call it the successor to the space shuttle that was retired some years ago. It's basically a super drone, and it has several times shown that it has the capability to, to stay in space orbiting the planet for an entire year at a time before it came back down and landed back on the Earth. Its jobs are supposedly secret, but we know that they're doing surveillance, not only in space, but also of the Earth below. They're helping identify targets, and they also have the capability on board this X-37 to basically intercept other countries' satellites because they have in the middle of it, you see this big bay door, they can open it up, they have an arm, they can reach out and they can actually take other countries' satellites. So it has also could function as an anti-satellite weapon, all right? This is a very controversial program called Rods from God rods from God. If the idea is that you would drop these tungsten steel rods from these orbiting platforms, and as they entered Earth orbit, they would gather speed, and their job is to take out underground nuclear missiles of Russia and China in a U.S. first strike attack, because they would be so fast, they would penetrate under the ground and destroy underground missile silos of Russia and China, okay? Another one of the orbiting battle stations coming back to this vision of the Nazis early on in the early 50s uh, are space-based lasers. These uh, would have the ability to uh, knock out other countries' satellites or even hit targets on the earth below, okay? This is an operational ground-based laser at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they've tested it and it has the capability to blind or even knock out or disable a, a competitor's satellite in space. So this also could be considered an anti-satellite weapon, all right? Cyber Command has become a major space weapon uh, for the military, and they've created a cyber, the Air Force Cyber Command. The first time cyber warfare was ever used was in 1999, when Bill Clinton and NATO launched the attack on Yugoslavia in order to break that country into pieces, to destroy that communist country as, uh, and bust it up, balkanize it, essentially. And what they did was uh, Clinton had the U.S. Uh, cyber uh, uh, operator, operators crawl inside Yugoslavia's air defense system and shut down their computers, basically, so that when the U.S. and NATO bombers were bombing Belgrade, hitting hospitals, schools, TV stations, remember they hit the Chinese embassy and said, oops, oh, the United States said, oops, oh, sorry, we used an old map. Oh, we didn't mean to hit the Chinese embassy, which of course is totally disingenuous. It was a warning to the Chinese that we have these capabilities. 
uh, but no NATO planes were lost in that attack that went on for some time because of the US shutting down the air defense system with a cyber, the first cyber attack ever. Today, they have serious cancer epidemics in some parts of Yugoslavia because of the, of the depleted uranium bombs that were used by US and NATO during that war. And since that time then, the whole cyber command has been growing and the money has been flowing into cyber operations like crazy. Uh, Russia has asked the United States to uh, negotiate a cyber treaty so that uh, offensive operations are restricted, but the US refuses to do so, okay? This is uh, one of our newsletters, Space Alert, where we uh, talked about the introduction of the Space Force. Uh, you can find our newsletters, all of our past newsletters on our website, spaceforpeace.org, okay? So the Trump administration, as you well know, uh, pushed through the Space Force. But what's really important to remember about that effort was it had to be approved first by the House of Representatives that even during Trump were controlled by the Democratic Party. So the Democrats had the ability, if they had wished, to stop Space Force dead in its tracks, and they didn't do it. In fact, the only thing the Democrats asked for during the debate on Space Force was that it be called the Space Corps rather than Space Force because it sounded a little less uh, aggressive. But Space Force has two primary missions. One is to give the US control of the earth below on behalf of corporate interests. And secondly, again, to develop the technologies to control the pathway on and off the planet earth. And uh, it's already been announced that any military personnel assigned to the Space Force will be called guardians, guardians of the heavens giving it sort of an angelic presence or angelic character, if you will, all right? Missile defense is one of the key programs. We talk a lot about it, but I'm not sure everybody really understands it. This is one of the key programs that the US uh, Space Command, Space Force uh, under, uh, undertakes today. And the idea of the missile defense is that it is a part of the fir US first strike attack program. In other words, the sword and shield. But first we have to go back to the George W. Bush administration when he pulled the US out of the US-Russia anti-ballistic missile treaty. The ABM treaty outlawed the development and deployment of these systems around the world and the US didn't like that. Uh, it really kind of, uh, the ABM treaty offered some kind of stability to the arms race because neither side could really have an advantage. You know, remember we had MAD, mutual assured destruction. Both sides had relative equivalents of nuclear forces. And so neither side could really have an advantage. But then when Bush pulled the US out of the ABM treaty, the Pentagon started undertaking more <clears throat> development and testing of so-called missile defense systems. And then when Obama became president, the program was put on steroids and the developments in the uh, deployments increased dramatically. And here you see in this graphic, a lot of these radar facilities around the world that helped direct this missile defense program. And the idea of missile defense, let's go to the next slide. The idea of it is that first we launch a first strike attack. That's the sword. The sword plunges into the heart of Russia and China, trying to take out <clears throat> their various nuclear forces underground, uh, underwater and submarines or nuclear bombers. So first strike tries to take out as many of those uh, platforms as possible. But then inevitably Russia and China launch their remaining retaliatory capability. And it is then that the missile defense shield is used 
to try to pick off that remaining retaliatory capability, giving the US a quote unquote successful first strike attack. And so there are various aspects, various uh, elements of the missile defense program. On the left, you see boost ascent. That means try to hit the missile soon after it's launched, much easier to do. It's easier to identify because you can see the exhaust coming from the rocket, you're close to it, uh, it's slow. So try to hit it in the boost phase. The second is mid course phase when it's way up in space, traveling at 15,000 miles an hour. This particular program will never work because it could the uh, missiles you're trying to take out could release decoys, it's traveling at speeds that make it really hard to intercept. This mid-course program is a total boondoggle. And then terminal program, try to hit it as it's uh, coming towards its final destination in its descent phase. And so the uh, boost phase and the terminal phase have had the greatest success uh, uh, in terms of their testing program. And the platform that has had the most success are the SM-3 missiles, the interceptor missiles that are on board the Navy Aegis destroyers that are made at Bath uh, Ironworks here in Maine. And today these Navy Aegis destroyers are being ported in the Black Sea, in the Barents Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, creeping up on Russian borders and also all along the Chinese coast as well. So this program is very, very dangerous and very deadly uh, as, as the uh, uh, Russians and the Chinese see it. Okay, moving on to the next one. One of the ascent, uh, uh, the terminal phase uh, programs is THAAD theater high altitude aerial defense. It's a ground-based army run uh, missile defense interceptor. And they're being deployed particularly surrounding China right now in Guam and South Korea, Japan, uh, other such places. Uh, this particular picture on the right is when they were, uh, when the military uh, components were rushed into a golf course on the edge of a, melon farming village in the mainland of South Korea and thousands of police were brought in to keep the, the melon farmers, mostly old people who tried to block the introduction of this missile defense system into their country. The radar for this particular mission will be able to see far into China and Russia as in North Korea as those countries border South Korea or border the Korean Peninsula. So the radar is seen as even more dangerous than the missile defense interceptor, okay? This is the uh, Aegis destroyer launching these missile defense interceptors. They're called SM-3, standard missile three. Again, their job is to be the shield after a US first strike attack has been launched. These warships can also launch Tomahawk cruise missiles which are first strike attack missiles and the Tomahawk uh, cruise missiles are nuclear capable as well, okay. Because the Aegis destroyers, the Navy warships have had the best testing program of all the various missile defense systems, they had the brilliant idea of putting these platforms also on land. And so they've created a program called Aegis Ashore, where you put the missile launch complex that's essentially on these warships, you put it on land. And the United States has built one of these at a base in Romania, very close to the Russian border. There's also one of these in Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. Go to the next slide. And there's also one now under construction in Poland. And so the U.S. is <clears throat> putting uh, these missile defense systems now on land and on sea surrounding both Russia and China. 
remember that I said that the cruise missile could carry nuclear warheads and would be part of US first strike attack uh, launch. They could also be fired from these same Aegis ashore platforms. And from either Romania or Poland, they would be able to hit Moscow in 10 minutes time. That's the cruise missiles could hit Moscow in 10 minutes time, all right? So for the last 20 years, Russia and China have been saying to the United States, you're encircling with uh, uh, us with these missile defense systems. You're taking away our ability to have a nuclear retaliatory capability. So we really can't afford to enter into dramatic uh, nuclear missile uh, reduction talks because we can't afford to give up our nuclear retaliatory system because we understand that the Pentagon is going for first strike capability. We can't lose that nuclear retaliatory capability. And that's one reason that, that uh, arms control has ground to a halt, plus the fact that the United States doesn't wanna do arms control anymore. And so uh, Russia and, and China have incidentally both renounced first strike attack, but the United States refuses to do so, saying we're keeping all op options on the table, all right? 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And at that time, George Herbert Walker Bush was president. His Secretary of State, Jim Baker, promised Mikhail Gorbachev, the uh, Soviet premier, that NATO would not expand one, <clears throat> one inch towards Russia. But then when Bill Clinton became president, he violated that promise made to Gorbachev and to Russia and began this expansion of NATO up to the borders of Russia, basically saying that, again, we're not interested in treaties, we're not interested in promises, we're only interested in domination, okay? And so today, since, since the time of uh, Clinton, so both during the George Bush, uh, George W. Bush administration, during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration, and now during the uh, Biden administration, NATO has been on steroids, moving closer and closer and closer to the Russian border. And so what is Russia to do? How are they to respond to this? And now today, uh, NATO is even trying to get into Ukraine, trying to get into Belarus, trying to get into Georgia and other countries as well. Okay, next slide. Due to climate crisis that we have today, the Arctic ice is melting. Some of you might know that a few years ago, our Maine uh, US Senator from Maine, Angus King, an independent supposedly, <laughs> went on a US nuclear submarine up to the Arctic. And uh, it was at that time it, uh, covered in the New York Times uh, in an article where the uh, commander of the US Navy at that time said that we must be able to control this part of the world. Ask yourself why? Why does the US want to control the Arctic? And now John Kerry, as you know, has been named Biden's climate czar. And one of his chief priorities, he says, is to make sure that people understand that the U.S. means business in the Arctic. Okay, next slide. What country in the world has the largest border with the Arctic? I think this map clearly shows that it's Russia. And so as the Arctic ice melts, and it's possible to drill, baby drill up there in that part of the world, the Western oil corporations want to control the Arctic so they can control the extraction of resources in that area. But also 
on this big country of Russia, there are all kinds of resources, minerals and other resources on the land. And the uh, resource extraction corporations want to get to them as well. So the Rand Corporation, which is famous for uh, creating the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War, Daniel Ellsberg, remember, smuggled them out to the New York Times and other newspapers around the country, telling the government's secret history of the war in Vietnam. Today, the Rand Corporation has done a study calling for the balkanization or the breakup of Russia into smaller countries so that the uh, resource extraction companies will be able to get to those resources if there's a whole host of countries on that big land mass there now. And I would submit to you that this is one of the key reasons for the continual US-NATO demonization of Russia that we see going on today, all right? This is a US military document. Uh, down at the bottom of it, you see green for army, white for navy, uh, blue for air force, et cetera. These are military maneuvers that have been happening in recent years along the NATO countries and along the Russian border, okay? In addition, the US and NATO have been having war games up in the, uh, up in the uh, uh, Arctic region, up in the Nordic region, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, uh, U.S. is expanding military operations in all of those places. Near the top in Norway, look for a town that says called Tromso, T-R-O-M-S-O, Tromso. It's one of the larger uh, uh, geographic uh, population centers in Norway. Recently, their, essentially their state government uh, said that they did not want to allow uh, U.S. nuclear submarines to port in Tromso. And the federal government in Norway at the behest of NATO and U.S. and NATO came down hard on that local government. So I'm not sure where that uh, particular decision sits today, but you see there are political maneuvers going on well within that whole area, okay? In addition, the U.S. has been having war games uh, right on the uh, Russian border up in Norway. And when they do, they bring in lots of equipment, U.S. and NATO does. Uh, U.S. ships over tons of military hardware on ships for these war games. And then they store it at new weapons depot hub created in Norway. So right on the Russian border, the U.S. is accumulating stockpiles of weapons for eventual military operations with Russia against Russia. Next slide. The same thing is happening in Poland, where the US has created a, a large base uh, where they are storing all kinds of military hard, hardware that is brought there for these war games in the region. And when the war games are over, the hardware is left there for eventual uh, use, okay? So you might know that the so-called color revolution that happened in Ukraine in 2014 was essentially a coup that was directed by the United States, directed and orchestrated, in fact, by Joseph Biden, who was vice president at the time. You know that his son, Hunter, there's been a lot of controversy about it, was put on a Ukrainian oil corporation board of directors after that coup where he made lots of money. He didn't have any experience whatsoever being a, on, uh, in the oil uh, industry, in the oil business. And today, uh, there's a war going on between the Kiev federal government, the neo-Nazi government that was installed by the US, and the citizens of the Donbass region. Right where you see in this graphic the words of Russia, that's essentially the Donbass, where right on the Russian border, on the Ukrainian side, there are whole parts of Ukraine that are Russian ethnic. These are people that uh, 
consider themselves Russian, they speak Russian. And right after the coup d'etat was enacted by the US, the new neo-Nazi government outlawed the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. And the people of the Donbass began protesting, saying, what are you talking about? This is our language. How can you outlaw our language? And they began, began having peaceful marches. And the federal government of Ukraine sent in troops to attack them. And so far since 2014, more than 10,000 people have been killed in this Donbass region right near the Russian border. Russia has helped to arm the, the people of the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republic, as they now call it. Russia did not invade, as the United States likes to say, but they have given weapons so that the self-defense forces there can protect themselves against these attacks that are US, NATO, uh, uh, trained, uh, outfitted, and directed. Some of you know that our dear friend uh, Regis Tremley uh, has a son that's in the US Army. He was sent as a trainer for a base in, in Western Ukraine on the other side of the country where these uh, neo-Nazi forces were brought in and trained in various military aspects and then sent to the Eastern part of the country the Russian border to fight against the people in these in the Donbass region. And so today it's believed that at any moment there's going to be another attack now that Biden is in the presidency uh, and uh, the US is reigniting the demonization of Russia. Many people believe there will be a, another attack. Just in the last week, there have been uh, videos showing that uh, uh, train loads, just legions of train cars full of tanks and armored personnel carriers, carriers are being shipped to this region uh, for a possible attack on the Donbass. And the question is, what will Russia do? Will they allow the US and NATO to direct this attack on the, the Donbass region? Will they respond to protect the Russian ethnic, the Russian speaking people along that border region. So this is a real trigger for war that could very easily go nuclear. And even people in the peace movement know very little about this uh, uh, today. And the American media never, of course, reports on any of this. All right, next slide. During the Obama administration, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton came up with the idea of a pivot to Asia Pacific to increase dramatically our military forces in that region. Uh, it's important to remember that Russia also has a, a border in this part of the world. The uh, board, Russia border is North Korea. And it was during the Korean War that General Douglas MacArthur sent warplanes over the border and to, uh, to bomb Vladivostok in Russia, trying to draw Russia into the Korean War but Russia did not respond. Okay, next slide. So today, starting at the bottom, bottom right, Australia, major, major deployments, uh, major increase of US military forces in Australia. Uh, Guam, uh, in the center of the graphic, the Philippines. Uh, US is back into Subic Bay, uh, the Navy base. Uh, where we were asked to leave back in 90, 1992, but today the US warships are docking there again. Uh, Guam is undergoing massive uh, deployment, missile defense systems, more Navy, more bombers. And then Japan, of course, major escalations going on in Japan, Okinawa, and on various islands in the uh, surrounding Japan. And then of course, throughout Korea, uh, major uh, US expansion of forces. And of course the Navy bumping up against uh, the coast of uh, China, going into the Taiwan Straits, trying to provoke a response from China. Okay, next slide. This is Jeju Island in South Korea, Kongjong village, a 500 year old fishing and farming village that was forced to build a Navy base that now ports US warships aircraft carriers, US nuclear submarines, and US nuclear destroyers. There's long been a daily, for about the last 12 years, a daily protest movement 
there in Kangjong village against these. Uh, quite a few people from uh, Maine have been to Jeju Island, uh, also people from Veterans for Peace and other organizations around the US and around the world have gone there in solidarity. Okay, next slide. Finally, I wanna talk about the privatization of space, the new gold rush. This is a book that was published some years ago by a NASA scientist who talked about the untold riches from the asteroids, comets, and planets. And he said, and whoever gets there and secures them and controls them will be rich beyond anything imaginable. And so in 2015, the Obama administration signed, Obama himself signed a new law called the Commercial Space Competitives Act to allow US citizens to make land claims for space resources on these planetary bodies. This violates the United Nations treaties, the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty that said no country, no corporation, no individual can make land claims and ownership claims of any of the planetary bodies. The planetary bodies, these treaties said, are the province of all humankind and all of humanity has to benefit from any eventual mining operations. Next slide. This is the vision for the dusty red planet that Elon Musk says he wants to occupy and he wants to nuke. Uh, they want to turn the red planet into a green planet. And today rovers are driving around. We just had a rover land just recently there, the United States did, powered with plutonium. Now, some people say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, plutonium in space, it's no danger. These things would never, if there was a launch accident, the plutonium would never be released on Earth. Don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. I want to refer you, though, to 1996, a story in the Santa Fe, New Mexico newspaper. And uh, it uh, reported on a lab contamination at Los Alamos Labs, where when they were fabricating the plutonium generators for the Cassini NASA space mission that carried 72 pounds of plutonium into space, there were 244 cases of worker contamination. Workers contaminated 244 cases when they were fabricating the Cassini plutonium generators. So we know that the Department of Energy has a long and dirty track record as they've been working on nuclear devices for nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and that they have a long track record of, uh, of uh, polluting water, polluting air in local communities, as well as uh, contaminating workers. So that the space nuclear industry is problematic even before a launch is made, okay? This is a nuclear rocket, a nuclear rocket that would get uh, US astronauts to Mars in half the amount of time because it would be powered with uh, space reactors. At the same time, these nuclear reactors would be able to be utilized to power weapons in space, okay? I referred to uh, Elon Musk's Mars missions, he wants to, send a thousand uh, nuclear bombs orbiting Mars, explode them in the atmosphere in order to uh, change the climate of Mars so that we could terraform Mars, make it a green planet rather than a dusty red planet. So um, this is pure insanity. This is absolute insanity. Imagine, imagine launching a thousand missions to Mars carrying nuclear bombs. It's just totally insane. Currently, Musk is also uh, launching thousands of up to 10,000 mini satellites orbiting the Earth for 5G. The Federal Communications Commission has given Musk permission to do so. Musk and Jeff Bezos the owner of the Washington Post, he also owns a launch company and other launch companies as well that wants to launch these 5G satellites 
in the space that would orbit the Earth. In, in order to make them worth, to make them work, to be able to receive those 5G satellite signals, to make uh, it possible to have 5G on Earth, they would have to put more than a million transceiver antennas around the planet to talk to these satellites as they orbit the Earth to receive these 5G signals. These uh, receivers would create all kinds of human and animal and plant life impacts because of the radio waves coming from them, essentially heating up the bodies of humans, heating up the bodies of animals, birds, bees, other insects would be uh, dramatically impacted by these. And so just last week, a lawsuit was filed before the FCC and is soon into federal court with the global network being one of the plaintiffs in this lawsuit to try to block these launches. These launches will also imagine thousands of launches with polluting rockets that are punching a hole in the ozone layer that are increasing the climate crisis. And astronomers are now complaining that these thousands of orbiting satellites blinking as they do when they're up there are going to make astronomers not able to see the night sky. So there are many different organizations and constituencies that are part of this lawsuit that has just been initiated, okay? In addition, because of all these launches, the orbits around the planet are becoming increasingly crowded. In 1989, I organized a protest at the Kennedy Space Center calling for peace in space. And our speaker that day was a Apollo astronaut, Edgar Mitchell, from Apollo 14 mission. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. And he said, if there's ever a war in space, just one war in space, it will be the one and the only, because it will create so much space debris, space junk orbiting the planet at 15,000 miles an hour that the planet will be, that, the, that this, this debris will become like a minefield sur surrounding the planet Earth, and that we will not be able to access space any longer. We'll be entombed to the planet below. There's a thing called the Kessler effect, that as more and more uh, orbits become crowded with all of these satellites that are being launched, and military satellites, and 5G satellites, and it, all these uh, other kinds of satellites that eventually they're going to start crashing into one another, a cascading effect, the Kessler effect. And when this happens, we will have dramatic problems with space debris, essentially shutting down life on the planet Earth that is hooked up to the satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay, next slide. One other thing about 5G is it's gonna have dramatic role in the militarization of space. 5G will be used to make uh, space intelligence, space surveillance, space targeting faster, more capable, particularly for drones and hypersonic weapons. So military is heavily involved in 5G. Now I know there's a lot of people, even in the peace movement says, you can't talk about 5G. That's, that's like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, anti-vaxxers, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's crazy. It's not scientific. Don't go near that 5G stuff. But one reason that's, that's being put out there by the media is because of the military applications. They don't want people to know about it, to focus on it, to talk about it, okay. So this slide is an example of this cascading, crashing orbital mess. And then go to the next slide. Here's an example of this debris field around the Earth. And I, I, a minute ago, I mentioned that as this cascading effect happened and satellites were crashing into each other, the International Space Station last year had to be moved three times to different orbit because 
They were tracking space junk that was coming dangerously close. When the earth goes dark, what I really mean is that cell phones, cable TV, internet banking, traffic signals, weather prediction, virtually everything we do today on the planet is hooked up to satellites. And when you start having this Kessler effect where everything crashes into everything, life on the planet Earth goes dark. What happens then? Next slide. So in the end, who is the aggressor? Let's look at this 2018. It hasn't changed dramatically since that time. US at that time was spending 36% of the world total. And look on the right side where you see France, UK, Germany, Japan, Korea, Italy, Australia, Canada, Turkey, NATO allies and US allies. When you add up all those numbers to the US total, it's well over 50%. And then look down for Russia. Russia, 3.4%. And since 2018, actually, Russia two times in 2019 and 2020 has cut their military budget because they say they have too much poverty in their country and they're trying to put more money into economic development. How could Russia seriously be a competitor to the US and NATO today and go up to look at China, 14%? Uh, how could Russia be a serious, I mean, China, sorry, be a serious competitor to the US and NATO today. And now to, today, NATO is creating what they call NATO partnerships in the Asia Pacific, where they're trying to bring in various countries from uh, the Pacific region into NATO. So NATO has the vision to become a global military alliance and essentially a global alliance to circumvent the United Nations, because right now, Russia and China at the UN can block declarations of war against various countries. They can veto it at the Security Council level. But if NATO is successful at becoming a global military alliance, then they say, we speak for the world. We don't need uh, UN's approval. It's being blocked by Russia and China. We can go forward with a declaration against any country, particularly Russia and China. Next slide. So how will the US in the end pay for all of this? Some years ago in one of the industry publications called Space News, they had an editorial that said, we've got to come up with a dedicated funding source in Washington, in Congress, to pay for all of these programs we want for space. And we have. And the editorial said, we're now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that program, those programs. And they called them the entitlement programs that officially are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the social safety net that is largely in tatters today. So these are the programs that the military industrial complex has identified to defund, to pay for Star Wars. Next slide. And you all know that the Pentagon today is the biggest polluter on the planet, has the biggest, largest carbon footprint on the planet, the biggest contributor to climate crisis. And now with all these launches that are punching a hole in the ozone layer, that problem is getting even worse. So thank goodness many of us are beginning to make that connection as well, okay? So in the end, this is the work of the global network. Every year before the pandemic, we would go to a different country, a different part of the world uh, and have our annual conference and our annual protest. This is the picture from when we went to Nebraska some years ago to Offutt Air Force Base where STRATCOM is headquartered. Uh, and, uh, but now we're not able to, at this time, go to these various countries. But this year in June, we'll have our global network conference as part of a, a coalition conference uh, that includes World Beyond War and many Canadian organizations. 
Uh, so be looking for that. It's, uh, inf information will be on our website events page. Last slide. This is a, a documentary that I highly recommend, award-winning documentary produced by a Canadian uh, filmmaker, Pax Americana and the Weaponization of Space. You can view it from the video section of our website. Uh, I would highly recommend it, it. It goes through many of these things that I've talked about today and does so in a very dramatic way. Interviews many military people, so it really gives their whole way of thinking, which I think is very important for people to hear. And finally, last, last uh, thank you all very much for listening, uh, for coming to this uh, talk today. Appreciate it. Okay. We have a boatload of questions. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through them all. And uh, the, the question is, with Trump gone, can't Biden just halt the Space Force by executive order? I would say I doubt it because it was passed as a, as a law by Congress. Uh, the president doesn't have the ability to just throw out a law. Uh, he would have to go back to Congress and ask for authorization to get rid of it. But uh, he's not going to do that. He's already said that he supports it. And right now, the big controversy around Space Force is whether or not the headquarters is going to be in Huntsville, Alabama or Colorado Springs, Colorado. Before he left office, Trump put it in uh Alabama because he wanted to thank the South for their support of his campaign over time. And uh, the, the thinking is that Biden might move it back to Colorado. So that's the only thing Biden is really talking about with the Space Force right now. He's, he fully supports it. Um, next question is a, a comment basically from Pat Elder. Um, talking about uh, addressing PFAS and the negative impacts it has affiliated with the Space Command. And you can check that link out on the chat. If you pull it up, you can copy it. And we'll share it in the chat when, when we share this video. Um, there's a, a little discussion between John Olson and Michael and uh, here's a question from Michelle. Didn't the U.S. sign a peace treaty to not have weapons in space? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, the U.S. has been refusing for the last, well, all the way back to the, uh, I guess, George Herbert Walker Bush administration. Every administration, both Republican and Democrat, has refused to negotiate with Russia and China a thing called PAROS, P-A-R-O-S, Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space, that would ban all weapons in space. There is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, signed by the US, <coughs> uh, former Soviet Union, and many other countries, that bans weapons of mass destruction in space, meaning nuclear weapons, nuclear explosions in space, but many of these new weapons are what Pentagon lawyers call weapons of selective destruction, not weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, they fall outside of the treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, and thus a new treaty is needed. So all through Republican and Democrat administrations up to the present moment, uh, the U.S. official position is, hey, there are no weapons in space. There's no problem. We don't need a new treaty. Next questions have to do whether Sweden is or is not in NATO. Sweden is not, although their arm is being twisted mightily. Uh, a former U.S. ambassador in Sweden, the son of Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, got us involved in Afghanistan, long as hated Russia. Uh, he wrote the book, The uh, the uh, 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 the grand chessboard that talks about how the U.S. has to control the uh, Middle East and Central Asia if we're going to control the world, and that's why we're there. That's why our bases are in Afghanistan and uh, other place, parts of that world. But anyway, Zbigniew Brzezinski's son, when he was U.S. ambassador under Obama, 
uh, in Sweden, uh, damn near broke Sweden's arm trying to get them into NATO. The people are against it, but the government is trying to make it happen. So uh, it's very possible it's going to happen. But they've been signed up as a NATO partner, which allows the U.S. to have these war games throughout Sweden. Up in northern Sweden, uh, there's a big, huge testing area for military operations that the U.S. utilizes quite often. And Tamara has put in the Space Alert newsletter contact in the chat. She's put in the Twitter contact. And there's a question from Rick. Is a new Russia, is a new Russian long-range missile maneuverable? Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, experts that I basically trust have said that Russia is anywhere between 15 and 30 years ahead of the United States right now in missile technology. Uh, you see they don't spend a lot of money because uh, they nationalize the production of, of their uh, weapons making. They don't have the profit system that we do. Uh, so they're able to really concentrate on quality. Uh, it's said that their fighter planes are much better than like the F-35, which is a disaster, the most expensive plane in the history of uh, aeronautics. But anyway, uh, the Russian hypersonic uh, weapons that are, are, uh, were made to basically evade, <clears throat> evade US missile defense systems, uh, they say uh, would travel at Mach 5 and uh, would not be able to be caught by any US missile defense system. So uh, that appears to be somewhat true. I think of it like the Maginot Line, you remember? when France was worried that Hitler was going to invade France prior to World War II, they created the Maginot Line, kind of like a graveyard, these things sticking out of the ground that would slow down the, the tanks of Hitler's army. And so Hitler just went around it. And so that appears to be what the uh, Russia hy Russian hypersonic weapons are intended to be, uh, systems that will evade US missile defense systems. Mm. Question from Barb. Is this technology all being shared with Israel with a comment that Israel is presently fighting Libya, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Lebanon, Gaza on and off? Obama promised Israel $39 billion for their military, $10 million a day from the United States taxpayers. Uh, I believe much of U.S. military technology is being shared with Israel. We know for sure that Israel's missile defense system is being co-facilitated between them and the United States. Uh, the, uh, in Alaska, there's a launch facility there called Kodiak Island on a pristine uh, natural preserve. Uh, a launch base was built against the public's uh, uh, wishes. And uh, Israel has brought over its rockets to test their missile defense system from Kodiak Island. The citizens there were told it would be a civilian launch thing. There would never be any military, but it's been just the opposite. Everything that's ever been launched there has been military, and they've had a number of crashes, launch accidents from there. So yes, indeed, uh, the U.S. and Israel are tied together like this on U.S. weapons, uh, on military weapons production. Um, what I'm looking through right now are a couple of good articles and follow-ups for what you've mentioned already. Um, let's see what else. Tamara's got lots of information to follow links to. Paul Cox and the Kessler effect. Tamara, new NATO initiative called NATO 2030. Um, and she's got a couple of links to uh, no, follow no to NATO. Let's see what else. There's a registration for the World Beyond War 2021 link in there. And uh, one last question, if your voice can hold out. Mm -hmm. And that is, how heavily armed is the Russian enclave around Kaling Kaliningrad? And this is going to be our last question. So I hope your voice can hold. I think it is uh, heavily armed. Uh, this is kind of near Poland. Uh, and uh, But I, I'm told, though, that NATO is encircling Kaliningrad right now. 
uh, as a way to try to neutralize uh, Russia's capability there. Uh, and, and again, if a war does start between US and NATO and Russia, uh, then uh, certainly NATO would try to take out everything in Kaliningrad in a first strike, I'm sure. Um, I'm not saying war will start. It would be suicidal. It would be insane for the United States to launch a war against Russia. Uh, the question is, would China be drawn into it as well? Uh, Russia and China have created a pact between them, a military pact, saying that they would protect one another in the event that they were attacked. Uh, but, you know, the United States is desperate, and the U.S. sees its unipolar, its singular control of the globe fading quickly. Our own country is essentially collapsing because of the serious contradictions in this country in terms of funding and development. Uh, and so the U.S. sees this window of empire collapsing, and it sees Russia and China and Iran and Venezuela and Brazil and many other countries rising to create a multipolar world where not just one country controls everything, but there's a, a more global democracy. The US fears that, doesn't want that. And so I believe is desperate and desperate people do desperate things. And so is the US capable of launching a first strike attack? Is it capable of, of of using nuclear weapons. Uh, I think if we look at history, we, we have to say the answer to both those questions is yes. In some circumstances, it is indeed true. And, and it, when you look at this full picture that I laid out today, it's obvious that the US is putting in motion this whole apparatus to make this possible, this first strike attack possible. I think one of my criticisms of the peace movement is that it's too silo focused. It doesn't do enough broad thinking. It doesn't do enough big picture presentation to the public so that the public understands how one thing fits together. Imagine a big puzzle on the wall, how the pieces of the puzzle come together to see the intentions, to see the capability of the US. And I think we need greater work in the peace movement on that, developing that articulation. So thank you so much, Bruce, for a wonderful, informative program. I want to thank the PeaceWorks, Peace Action Maine, Maine Veterans for Peace, Wolf Maine, and Maine Natural Guard for those groups that have helped co-sponsor this. We want to thank every single person that is still on this, this site. <laughs> and. Um, it was a great presentation and we hope to see all of us together some at some point again. Um, I think that's it. Any any. Um, oh, and thank you, Ellen Thomas, so much for helping co host this event. And we want to also thank our Rosalie for introducing Bruce. So long, everyone. And thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martha. Yep. Thank you, Rosie.